Hello and welcome to our program about traumatic brain injuries. My name is Lester Rice and my son is a traumatic brain injury survivor. Did you know that every 23 seconds someone in the United States suffers from a traumatic brain injury? Did you know that almost 320,000 individuals in Florida are living with a traumatic brain injury? There is a great deal of news coverage about traumatic brain injury these days, focused on the frequency of injuries arising from the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. But today's focus is on TBIs in the sports world as a result of hard physical contacts. Our guest today is Dr. Robert Winnegar, a neuropsychologist who specializes in pediatric sports concussion management. Dr. Winnegar will provide us with an overview of sports head injuries, some of the myths about sports concussions, some theories of the brain's reaction to concussion, and even propose legislation to standardize sports head injury treatment protocol. Traumatic brain injury is a subject that is very dear to me and many other parents and caregivers. And I hope that this program will help inform and educate you about sports concussion what it is, what are the leading causes, some treatments, services, and other key issues. Dr. Winnegar, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I'd like to start, I often think that people don't realize that a concussion is a head injury. So will you please give us a definition of what concussion mm -hmm. is? Certainly, Lester, and thank you for having me. Uh, concussion is actually a term, a Latin term, that means to shake violently. And I think that's a good working term for those, uh, you know, considering concussion. Uh, a concussion is really a, a blow to the head or to the body that creates a physical or a cognitive or even emotional consequence for the student athlete. So the blow to the head occurs, you have, and I know we'll talk about this later, you have a, an upset to the brain and then you have consequences from there. Okay, you had mentioned to me too that you don't have to be knocked out to mm -hmm. have a, a concussion. That's right, and that's one of the, the greatest kind of misnomers or, or myths about concussion, and that is, well, if you're not knocked out, you haven't sustained some kind of injury. Mm -hmm. The statistics, I believe, show that only in about 16% of the cases is there a loss of consciousness after the blow to the head. So oh, that's you, very So 84% so of the time, you might have a concussion without loss of consciousness. So that really, uh, I think, uh, brings to light the importance of paying close attention to symptoms and not just whether the student athlete it's been knocked unconscious. Mm -hmm. And I think you also had mentioned to me that, that a, a, a strong blow to the body can cause the head to rock back and forth and that too can result in, mm -hmm. in a head injury. Th that's right. You know, a lot of people think that a concussion can only happen with a blow to the head. Right. When uh, we know that uh, there can be a, a blow to the body that causes a whiplash effect, okay, in which the brain shakes inside yes. the head, or the head can uh, strike the ground or strike a knee or another helmet. So, uh, you know, just looking for uh, a head-to-head -head contact to explain the symptoms is probably going to lead you astray. Okay, and what are some of the statistics about who suffers a, a, a sports concussion? Mm -hmm. Well, the, the statistics are very fluid because I think if you've been following in the, in the news over the last couple of years, you know, there's a lot of attention being paid to sports-related concussion. Uh, the statistics that I cite most often are the following. It's believed that there are between 1.8 and 3.6 million concussions a year, uh, and the perhaps more telling statistic is that within a contact sport season, it's, it's conjectured that perhaps up to 20% of the participants do experience concussion during that season. 
Oh, for goodness sakes. Mm -hmm. it's a big I, number. And also, I understand that girls' uh, head injuries or, or sports concussions are on the rise. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about that? <clears throat> That's absolutely true. You know, I, I think that the, 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 uh, the culture that we live in comes to expect, you know, boys' football to be the greatest producer of concussion, and it certainly does produce its number. But uh, girls uh, do experience concussion at a higher frequency. Uh, some of the speculation behind that uh, points to the following. One is that uh, the, the, the neck muscles of a girl might not be as developed as, of, uh, as those of a, of a boy player, and so their head is naturally on, on an anchor that's perhaps a bit less sturdy. The other is that uh, perhaps uh, a female or a girl would report their symptoms more readily than would a boy. They might be more in, uh, open to talking about uh, how they're feeling about their symptoms um, than perhaps a male player would. Interesting. And I understand, too, that uh, injuries in young children is on the rise. And if I may, I want to quote from your uh, PowerPoint presentation on this subject uh, from a pediatrics, uh, which is a publication uh, article uh, in August of 2010, that between 1997 to 2007, ER visits for sports-related concussion in 14 to 19-year-olds went from 7,000 to 22,000. And for 8 to 13-year-olds, ER visits for sports-related concussion went from 3,800 to 8,000. That, that mm -hmm. sounds like a, a, mm -hmm. a tremendous increase mm -hmm. for young children. So what, what is going on with that? Yeah, good question. I think this is, this is very important because, uh, as we'll get to, I think that paying more attention to young student athletes is, 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 really, uh, is really an important focus. Uh, a couple different things come to mind. One is that as our awareness of concussion increases, Increases, that may therefore create an increase in the amount of times that people are sent to the emergency room. Well, whereas, that's a good thing. Yeah, whereas in the old days, maybe they wouldn't have gone. Today, they'll go to the emergency room because they know maybe a little bit more about concussion. The second factor that I think is important to discuss is that student athletes these days are, I think, much more physically fit, stronger, faster, better trained. They train year round versus once a week. So when there is a collision between two athletes who are much bigger and stronger and faster than they were perhaps 10, 15, 20 years ago, you're going to get a greater G-force and therefore a greater chance for injury. Interesting. Mm. And what are some of the <clears throat> myths about sports concussions? Mm -hmm. Well, I think the, the one we've talked about is the fact that uh, a concussion equals loss of consciousness. That, mm -hmm. That's a myth. That's, that's just not the case. It's more, more likely the case that it, mm -hmm. there's no loss of consciousness involved. The second would be that, that sports concussion is restricted solely to football. And we know that to be not, not the case. Um, in fact, um, as I'm understanding it now, girls' soccer is becoming one of the greatest producers of sports-related concussion. That's interesting, um, but yeah, because soccer seems to be becoming even more popular. Mm -hmm. it, it is, and as I said, the players are much bigger and stronger and faster, but other sports that you may not consider to be dangerous to the head turn out to be. For example, uh, cheerleading is one of the largest producers of concussion and catastrophic uh, neurological injury. That's very interesting. When you told me that when we were having a discussion earlier, that, that surprised me. You know, mm -hmm. I just never thought about that. Mm -hmm. that the, and, and again, hopefully this program will bring some of these details into awareness. Baseball, volleyball, soccer, football, cheerleading, uh, you know, riding four-wheelers is a, is a producer of injury. So I think we need to expand beyond the belief that it's just boys high school football that produces these injuries. I think those are the most kind of dramatic, but it certainly happens at all levels. Well, and, the, and I think it's important that we all become more aware that, the, that as you said, that it, it's not just boys football. In fact, I had recently read that the largest number of sports head injuries uh, are suffered by cyclists. Hmm, interesting. I, I think mm -hmm. that was, uh, I, I think that came from an, an article uh, in uh, uh, neurosurgery. Mm, mm. So, um, let's. Uh, would you also please explain the neurometabolic cascade mm -hmm. effect that occurs during a head injury? I'd be happy to. This is a term that that refers to 
the brain's response to a catastrophic impact. And essentially what the brain does is it goes into a crisis or emergency mode, wherein it tries to kind of work overtime to rectify the injury at kind of a neurochemical level. So the brain is, is calling in all of its possible resources in order to rectify this injury. And I think that obviously it's important to know about the metabolic cascade that happens. It's a, it's a fancy term, but I think the more important factor here is that we need to be aware that it is happening because it is during this time that the player is at a great vulnerability to further very serious injury. So is that what leads then to the second impact syndrome mm -hmm. that we're now learning about? Sure, that's the theory. Se second impact syndrome, uh, for the viewer's um, information, is a phenomenon in which uh, the, the brain is thought to be in a, in a crisis state or a vulnerable state post-concussion, and it takes a very minimal impact um, to create a catastrophic situation in which the brain loses its ability to regulate its blood flow. So, the re again, the reason we need to be uh, alert to the possibility of, of, of injury is that we don't want players to go back and play before, the, before this neurometabolic cascade has resolved itself. So there's a really critical time when having the player anywhere near the potential for con uh, uh, or, or any kind of contact to the head, it, it's, it's dire. It's really important to be aware of it. So the brain is um, more uh, vulnerable mm -hmm. than to, to sustaining a, a second injury. That's right. Which is part of the reason why we hear sometimes a particular, about some of the um, football uh, figures. I, I'm, I'm trying to think of the, oh. <laughs> forgive me, um, <laughs> recently um, uh -huh. uh, one of the uh, older football players mm -hmm. who had a couple of head injuries or, or a couple of um, concussions, concussions yeah. last fall and, mm -hmm. and then finally retired. I can't think mm -hmm. of his name right we, now. We, well, we are hearing a lot about this now um, where uh, former players who are certainly not elderly, they're in their, in their 40s and their 50s, are experiencing uh, symptoms uh, uh, thought to be very characteristic of uh, a, a dementia in older people. So there, I don't, I don't know if this is something you wanted to get to now, but there's a there's a growing fear of um, a phenomenon called CTE, which stands for chronic traumatic encephalopathy, and it's a phenomenon found in a lot of these former players' brains. And when they when they um, take a cross section, they're only able to look at the brains obviously when the players are deceased. Uh, but when they look at a cross section of the of the brains. Uh, physiology, what they're seeing is striking similarities between that and the brains of very elderly dementia patients. And so the concern is that uh, over the years, these players have sustained head injury after head injury after head injury, never been treated particularly well, and it's potentially causing, or the line is being drawn between those events and this phenomenon called CTE. That's very interesting, yes. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk more about that mm -hmm. uh, in a little while, too. Mm -hmm. um, Based on this information, what is the protocol when a an athlete is injured? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's really what's most important here, right? You know, the uh, uh, there's certainly a return to play protocol, which I'm happy to talk about. But really, I think the 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 essential point is that if a player is ever suspected of of, of having sustained a head injury, and this is perhaps uh, first recognized by the coach or the teammate uh, or the team trainer or the player himself, it's essential that they get removed from play because we don't want this vul potentially vulnerable brain to suffer a second blow and then you start to think about something like second impact syndrome. So the, the protocol is really get the player off the field and keep them off the field until they've been properly mm -hmm. evaluated. Now the, I think the best practice advice that I can give is if you've uh, sustained a concussion or if your child has sustained a concussion, it's probably important for them to go to the emergency room so that they can have a study done to eliminate the possibility of there being a fracture or a bleed of some type, some kind of structural problem. And at that point, the care is typically turned over to a pediatrician or somebody like me with some experience in sports related concussion management. And then there's a whole return to play stepwise protocol that helps them get back into uh, competitive activities in a safe way. Okay, um, let, if, if, a, if a player is injured during the game, who makes that determination though, mm -hmm. whether to take him or her out of the game mm -hmm. or, you know, if it's a cheerleader that 
falls and and, mm -hmm. and is injured or, or whatever. Well, that's that's, a, that's an essential question. You know, the the research indicates that only about half of schools have a certified athletic trainer who would be trained to make that determination. So quite often the determination is going to fall to the coach, right? The assistant coach, maybe even the player's family. So the 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 important point though is that the the coaching staff, I believe, and the, and the player himself or herself and the family need to be acutely aware of what the symptoms are, the signs and symptoms of concussion, and for them to take that very seriously. And I understand that, that this has led the Brain Injury Association of Florida to propose a bill, uh, it's Senate Bill 370, uh, to develop some type of standardized structure here. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Right, the, the Brain Injury Association of Florida uh, put a work group together um, uh, to try to come up with uh, legislation that would address this very problem. Um, a couple years ago, the state of Washington was the first to enact such, such legislation. It was called the Zach Lystedt uh, Act. Uh, he was a player who uh, sustained a concussion and was not taken off the field in a timely manner and experienced the second impact syndrome. So Washington was the first state. There have been several other states since then to enact uh, very similar legislation. And now Florida is, 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 is going to do the same, I hope. It's, it's been written, I believe it's, uh, we have a couple of sponsors now that are, that are working the uh, legislation up. But essentially what the legislation says, it's very simple, it says if a player in, in any sport, we're not just talking about football, uh, uh, experiences an injury, a head injury, and is symptomatic, they absolutely have to be taken off the field. And they are not allowed to return to play that game or subsequent games or practice until they've been cleared uh, to do so. Um, and it also requires the player's family to sign a, an acknowledgement that this is, you know, this is what concussion is, these are the signs and symptoms, um, and you understand that this is what's going to happen to your player should, should they demonstrate signs or symptoms of concussion. Uh, it, the, the, the legislation, as I understand it, is very similar to that seen in other states. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, my impression is that the legislation in other states has passed fairly, fairly readily. So my hope is that uh, this will happen in Florida. And it's really such a, such a simple step to not only put concussion in people's in the forefront of their minds, but also to really protect the players. It seems very simple, elegant, and proactive, and hopefully this will go a long way to protect some kids from uh, potential damaging subsequent injury. Well, you served on a committee that studied this. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us a little bit about that. Well, it, yeah, this this was the concussion task force, which was um, which was uh, put together by the Brain Injury Association, okay. and uh, there are actually several of us. Uh, so so the conference calls were interesting because we were all talking at the same time. But really, what we wanted to do is is follow the lead uh, of of Washington State, and that is to create. Uh, you know, fairly straightforward and simple legislation that, that would, as I said, bring into the forefront of people's minds concussion, what it is and how we treat it, and protect the kids who play. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. Um, as a former legislative aide, um, I will keep an eye on that bill uh, because I think uh, that's important. It would, be, it would be nice for people who see the show to call their representatives you know, and let them know yes. that they think it's important. And that Senate bill 370. I'm sorry, I don't have the House bill, okay. but but there is a companion bill in the House, mm -hmm. so um, we'll we'll follow up with that. Good. And talk to us a little bit about injuries that are suffered during practice time. Mm -hmm. For example, one of your statistics says that 58 percent of college and 38 percent of high school concussions occur during practice. Mm -hmm. Interesting, isn't it? And if you really think about it, it makes sense. You know, uh, uh, you know, I I played uh, sports. You know. Um, so I can I can speak to this. You know, you spend most of your time on the on the practice field, mm -hmm. and, and far less time actually playing in the game. Right. And a sport like football, you're spending, you know, two three hours each night after school practicing for maybe three or four minutes of intense activity that that Friday night right. or that Saturday. So I think it's really very logical to look at practice as a reasonable place to start uh, thinking more seriously about concussion. Um, you know, the statistics are pretty staggering that most serious concussions do occur during practice time. And I think that what we might eventually see is some um, movement toward uh, legislating or at least restricting the amount of head, in, uh, head contact that can happen during practice. 
Yes, yes. I, well, I, and again, um, it, it certainly makes sense, but it's something that one never thinks about. Mm -hmm. One only thinks about what happens during the game. Mm -hmm. And as you said, more time is spent uh, practicing than, than right. those actual three or four minutes. Certainly, I mean, if you think about, you know, if you think about football on Sunday afternoon that we all enjoy watching, you know, we watch for the big hit, it's very exciting, you know, concussions right. happen, we see it right in front right. of us. But what we don't see is that those players, high school players included, are practicing each day prior to that event and certainly uh, engaging in pretty serious contact, right? So. Yes, and again, it's not just football. It's other sports, mm -hmm. and it's cheerleading, and mm -hmm. it's, I'm sure it's the drill teams mm -hmm. and things like that. So we want our audience to remember mm -hmm. these statistics and, mm -hmm. and this information. Mm -hmm. um, let's go back again and talk about um, the, the CTE, mm -hmm. the, uh, if, if you'll explain that again, because mm -hmm. I'm not really clear on that one either. Right. Well, I'm not a neurologist, so I, you know, uh, the, the, there, there is a, a group in, I think it's at uh, Boston University that has a center for, for a CTE study. And it's headed by some very, really very well-known uh, neurologists and neuropsychologists uh, who, who certainly do a lot of um, uh, research within the area of sports-related concussion. What they're doing is they are being uh, essentially bequeathed the, the bequeathed the brains of former players okay. and, and uh, families you know donate the brain for study and you know every couple of weeks you're hearing stories about uh, former players bequeathing their brain to the CTA uh, the, the study the, uh, the studies and finding that their brains in fact do look compromised and as I said they look very much like the brains of uh, a dementia a patient uh, the I think what, what, you know, what frankly frightens me a little bit about this is that what was initially a phenomenon restricted to just former NFL players is now seen in much younger players. And in fact, a couple months ago, uh, a, a college football player um, uh, died, uh, committed suicide, uh, gave his brain, his family gave the brain to the Center for CTE study, and it was found that he did have CTE. Now, this was a player who reportedly didn't have a significant history of concussion, but had always played football. And so he was one of the first players that I know of who showed CTE, who was not a gristled, you know, 20 year NFL veteran, right. but rather a, a, I think he was a senior on a, on a, on a fairly, uh, um, uh, a fairly competitive college football team. Right. So, you know, I think it's important not to become alarmist about this, but at the same time, I think what it does is it provides us the opportunity to look at this very closely and say, what are we needing to do here to protect kids so that over time their brains do not uh, injure and re-injure and re-injure, mm -hmm. so perhaps CTE one day will be a, a, uh, a distant memory. And I think we're, 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 we have, the, we have a, a very kind of... Uh, Great, we have a great opportunity here, I think, to, to, to begin putting this uh, in, the, in the forefront of people's uh, thinking so that perhaps we can eliminate this as a problem long term. Yeah, that's very sad. Mm -hmm. uh, my son was 18 years old when he was injured, and it, it, it's had a catastrophic effect on not only him and his life, but on me and my life and his sister, you know, our entire family. Mm -hmm. And to have something like that happen to such a young individual, you know, when they're just at the very beginning of, of their life, mm -hmm. it, it, it's a shame. Mm -hmm. And I certainly feel bad, I, and my heart goes out to anyone whose child mm -hmm. takes his or her life, yeah. Yeah. you know, and it, it just contributes. Well, yeah, and, and again, I think that the, the, the important um, thing that we can do here is really try to support the legislation that will allow us to perhaps catch that one kid who was right. concussed and is dying to go back in and he's right. begging to go back in, he, he's competitive, he wants to go back in, he can't go back in. And right. if he doesn't go back in, maybe we've stopped that cycle from exactly. happening and we've saved this one kid from a, you know, a lifetime of pretty significant right. problems yes. potentially. Yes, again, that second impact syndrome. Mm -hmm. That's right. Um, why is it that, that players don't report their symptoms? Mm. Well, uh, you know, having played uh, soccer collegiately, I can tell you that in the heat of the battle, you would go out there with a broken leg, you know, a concussion, it didn't matter. Yeah. Um, and it's hard to convince a young person uh, of the wisdom of not going back in, in the, when it's in the heat of the battle. So it's, you know, I think that teenagers in particular have this kind of aura 
uh, or this 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 fantasy of invincibility, you know, where they can go out and mm -hmm. they'll, they'll be okay. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if they're so great at seeing things big picture or long term, but that might be a separate issue. But uh, you know, I think we have a certain warrior mentality in our culture. Um, you know, we enjoy the big hit. We enjoy the guy laying on the field after being you know rocked coming over the middle. So you know, I think that that's that's exciting and and. Um, and we, we enjoy that and I think we encourage it by cheering for it and showing it on YouTube and such. Um, also, I think players don't want to let their teammates down. You know, teams create a certain uh, cohesiveness and a certain uh, sense that we're, it's us against them and I don't think they want to let their, let their uh, teammates down. Some players go back in because they don't understand the seriousness of concussion and what the long-term consequences can be. So there are a lot of different reasons. Um, it, it's interesting in my conversations with teenage football players in particular, very few of them know anything about sports-related concussion. And I was telling you the other day that uh, one of them, in fact, said to me, the only thing I ever knew about concussion is from the little sticker on the back of my helmet that says, this helmet does not protect right. you from concussion right. or, or significant injury. And he said, no one has ever talked to me about concussion aside from that one sticker, which he read, thank goodness. So, um, you know, it, it's not just, I think, the teenage mind that we're talking about here, but we're also talking about how adults around them um, uh, alert them to and educate them about the, the risks of concussion mm -hmm. and even, even how to recognize them. Mm -hmm. So what can we as parents and as coaches do uh, to, to help with this, with this issue, mm -hmm. with you know, getting kids, getting uh, student athletes or uh, young athletes mm -hmm. to report their symptoms. Sure. Well, I I'm hoping that the legislation, should it pass, will be a big step in that direction. Um, you know, uh, making the parents uh, responsible for signing something that says, yes, we understand what this is and how important it is for us to kind of, you know, um, communicate this to our kids. So my hope with that, that, that is that that would be a great first step. Um, uh, I go to schools and I talk to coaches about concussion. Um, uh, Frankly, I think the interest has been rather lukewarm over time, but I hope that changes. Um, another uh, uh, piece of at least my practice, um, and, and I know that you and I haven't talked a whole lot about this, is that the, the best practice parameters with regard to making the return to play decision and protecting kids going forward is to have some type of preseason neurocognitive assessment that allows us to see where is this player functioning before they jump into the fray? What, what is their brain functioning like? So that we can use that as a benchmark and determine where were they, where do they need to be before they're healthy again. So in my practice, I give a, um, uh, a, a computerized baseline assessment that takes about 25 minutes to do. And um, that's another, I think, st uh, step that we can make going forward that, that will uh, allow us to make good, more objective decisions about when kids are hurt how hurt are they, and where they, do they need to be in order to get back into play? So this is something that would be done on each player prior, prior to the or when the playing season starts. A absolutely, and it's interesting. Uh, we were talking about this before. The NFL, the NBA, Major League Baseball, Major League Soccer, the U.S. Army and Navy, Cirque du Soleil, all these organizations that that, that uh, engage in activities that do create concussion use baseline testing. Absolutely. Oh, now see, that's yeah. interesting. I didn't know that. And you mentioned Cirque du Soleil. Once mm -hmm. again, mm -hmm. I never thought about mm -hmm. the, those performers, oh, athletes, sure. <clears throat> suffering uh, head injury, right. but certainly they could. It's interesting, yes. right? And so what, what these organizations do is they do, they do the, the, the pre-season baseline testing so that in the event of a concussion, there can be some sense of pre-concussion status, and then you can make good decisions from there. Unfortunately, I think that the trickle-down to uh, the high school age kids, and certainly you know middle school, and, uh, has been very slow. And so that's you know being a pediatric neuropsychologist, my focus has been on getting out there and letting people know that this is an option for their young athletes as well. Certainly, it's evident in college. I would imagine that most big college programs use baseline testing, but uh, uh, you know until very recently. No local high schools have, have, uh, have engaged in baseline assessment, uh, and um, I, I put a lot of effort into getting the word out there because it's, 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 uh, it's an easy thing to do, it's simple, it's almost free, and uh, it really gives uh, someone like me a lot of information to go on when it comes time to determine when a player is ready to go back in again. Well, that's certainly good to know. It sounds to me like one of the key things here is education, education, education. Mm education about what is a, a 
sports concussion, what is a concussion, what is a, you know, a head injury, uh, and who suffers them, and, mm -hmm. and this and that. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad to know that you're out mm -hmm. there doing mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Um, let's talk about some of the prevention efforts mm -hmm. right now. I had just read where Wake Forest is using Toyota's injury simulation software to find ways to make football helmets safer and that Virginia Tech has accelerometers. I don't know if I'm saying that I correctly. I think it might be accelerometer, I'm not sure. Oh, accelerometer, <laughs> okay. Uh, in its football helmets, mm -hmm. uh, the sensors have measured the force of the blow and transfer it to a team doctor. They've been using these since 2003 and they've detected more than 170,000 impacts, 70% of them during practice mm -hmm. and 30% of them during games, mm -hmm. which I found interesting, you know, since now we've talked about that more injuries occur during practice, mm -hmm. during the practice time. So what do you think about something like mm -hmm. this or, or other preventive measures? Well, you know, let, let's talk about helmets for, for a second. Um, you know, the, the helmet companies are always doing studies about, you know, the safety of their helmets, what types of helmets would be best. As I understand it right now, there is no helmet that prevents concussion. I think that's very important for people to know. Um, there are certainly more expensive helmets than others, mm -hmm. although I've seen kids uh, in my practice who have the most expensive, technologically complex helmets, and they had concussions. Uh, mm -hmm. So, so uh, I think concussion um, helmet technology is improving. Uh, they certainly do a good job of protecting from you know uh, you know uh, uh, um, fractures, things like that. You know uh, injuries to the face. But I don't want people to think that that just wearing a helmet is enough to. Uh, uh, prevent concussion because concussions will continue to happen despite whatever helmet technology we use though I'm sure that things will change over time. Um, I think there had been some talk at one point about mouth guards having an effect on uh, concussion. I don't know a lot about that actually. Um, so I think that, that as it stands now and, and as I said before this is a very fluid area right now uh, we're always learning new things about concussion I think it's really important to operate at least under the assumption for now that concussions are going to happen. Whether you're a football player, a soccer player, a baseball player, a cheerleader, hockey in particular, you're, you're going to have concussions occur. How do, we, how do we identify these kids and protect them going forward? Now in terms of the, uh, the accelerometers in the helmet, I find those studies fascinating because some of the... Well, it certainly is interesting. Yeah, it's, it's interesting when you look at the, the G-forces that are created by collisions uh, between big football players right. are, are incredible. And in fact, I think I read that sometimes they are equivalent to or greater than the G-forces that fighter pilots experience during takeoff. Oh so my gosh. so you really, it really doesn't take a great leap forward or a leap of faith to assume that if they're colliding like this over and over and over again, what is the long-term effect? Now, one of the interesting components of these studies that you refer to is that these collisions aren't causing concussion. They're just registering it in the, in, the, in, the, in the player's helmet to a computer on the sidelines. But each one of these con uh, collisions does not create a concussion. These players get up and go back and play again. So the question is, over the years, repeated kind of what are called sub-concussive blows, what is the cumulative effect of these blows? And I think, I think what, what the concern is, uh, is that maybe some of these NFL players are showing the who are showing CTE are really showing us what happens year after year after year, sub-concussive blow, sub-concussive blow, so thousands of times over the course of many seasons. They don't really have to have had that one severe blow that mm. that may cause unconsciousness or right, or right. a concussion uh, or, or what's more visible as a concussion. That's exactly that's just exactly a right. Series of, mm -hmm. Well, that's really yeah. interesting. I remember too. when I played soccer, there were times when I would um, get hit in the head or even kicked in the head at times, and I wasn't symptomatic. I, I didn't feel fu you know fuzzy or lose my memory or get emotional or forget things, but it really rang my bell. Now, yes. the question is, and perhaps a football player or a hockey player, what if this happens a thousand times over their career? Cumulatively, what's the effect? And I think that's something that right. people are looking at very seriously right. right now. Well, and again, not all sports concussions are uh, suffered by football players mm -hmm. or hockey players who wear a helmet. Mm -hmm. You know, soccer players don't wear helmets and baseball mm -hmm. players don't wear helmets. And mm -hmm. um, wow, well, well, 
a lot of food for thought. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Is there anything else that about uh, sports concussions that you uh, that you would like to share with us, or tell us mm -hmm. a little bit about your mm -hmm. what you may see in your pediatric practice? Mm -hmm. Well, it's it's I think one important point here, and I, I think that if if there's a an important point to be made, this would be it. Um, concussions are very individual. Okay, what what is a concussion for you might not be a concussion for me. Good um, point. A, a, a very minor blow might cause tremendous symptomatology in you, not uh, not so much me. So uh, you know, in my practice, what I try to do is treat each each child or teenager I see as a completely new person, an individual who has his own uh, set of experiences and uh, strengths and weaknesses, and there really is not a one-size-fits-all for these kids, and I think that's a, that's a dangerous place to get to um, when we try to see them all as very similar. And so my hope is that when this legislation passes, if it does pass, I hope it does, those who uh, treat these kids, those who see these kids, those who try to monitor the return to play protocols can really understand that each kid is his own individual and there's really not a one size fits all and, uh, and I think in that, in that way we will be able to treat them uh, um, adequately at least, I hope. Yeah. That's very helpful. So in closing, we've learned a great deal about sports head injuries today. We've learned exactly what is a concussion, how many athletes suffer a concussion, what some of the myths are and aren't, and that more head injuries occur during practice than actual games, and about the second impact syndrome, and the need to have the appropriate protocol to determine whether or when an athlete or cheerleader returns to play, and that education about this critical issue is probably the most important preventive me measure for sports head injuries. I hope this program has provided you with valuable information and education about traumatic brain injury and sports concussions, along with guidelines about how to recognize an injury and how to get and give appropriate treatment. Additionally, we want to provide you with hope for the future of prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of sports head injuries. Thank you to my guest, Dr. Robert Winnegar, and thank you for joining us. Remember, traumatic brain injury is the last thing on your mind until it is the only thing. For more information, please go to www.biaf.org. Helpline in Florida is 1-800-992-3442.